So yeah, uh, our presentation tonight is what we can do about San Francisco's drug crisis. Before we get started, I want to tell you a little about our organization, Together SF Action. As I mentioned, my name is Kanishka Chang. I'm the executive director and the founder. We are a civic engagement and advocacy organization equipping San Francisco residents with the knowledge and tools they need to build a stronger, safer, and more prosperous San Francisco. Uh, you may have seen our voter guide in the November 2022 election, or you may have volunteered with our sister organization, Together SF. We do a lot of trash pickups. Um, graffiti removal, mural painting, uh, those kinds of community building events. A little bit about me and our leadership team at Together SF. I left my career in City Hall to start Together SF because I know the change we need to make to turn our city around is best achieved by getting more residents engaged and informed. So that's what we work to do now. I'm a former city planner, legislative aide, and I've held leadership roles in Mayor Breed's administration. I have over 15 years of experience in local government, policy, and politics. Um, the woman, the blonde in this picture is Margot Kelly. She oversees our community engagement team. She's also spent the last 15 years working in City Hall. She has firsthand knowledge of the ways it needs to change and how community building is the key to that change. At Together SF, her team is focused on building leaders who will mobilize their communities to demand our elected leaders address the city's issues. So we are trying to find a lot more folks like you all who are very involved in your neighborhood. Um, the other woman in this picture is Tanya Malillo. She has an MBA from Stanford and she left her 20 year career in business to take all of her uh, for-profit marketing and operations skills and apply it to what we're trying to do at Together SF. She oversees our content and marketing team and is focused on growing the largest group of engaged San Francisco voters who demand change. Our vision for San Francisco is that everyone has enough trust and knowledge to earnestly participate in local democracy. We believe that ending the drug crisis is a crucial step towards that. So let's dig in for our program for today. Uh, the city is in the middle of a public health crisis fueled by fentanyl that continues to literally take the lives of San Franciscans every single day. I'm gonna tell you tonight the story of what's happening in San Francisco with the drug crisis and brace yourselves because it really, it really is horrifying. The drug epidemic is at the heart of San Francisco's dysfunction. To become a functioning and vibrant city, we must first close open air drug markets. We think the drug epidemic is the primary issue the city should be working on. Homelessness, mental health, housing, public safety, the drug epidemic is intrinsically linked to all of these problems. In order to see any improvement in those areas, we must first address the drug crisis. Today, we're gonna to explain how this crisis influences the city's dysfunction and why it's the responsibility of our city leaders to fix it. When COVID started, San Francisco went all in to keep the virus at bay. So let me ask you this. Why can't we do the same for the drug epidemic that has already claimed more lives than COVID in the same time period? Let me repeat that. The drug epidemic has killed more people in San Francisco than COVID in the same time period. Our goal is to get our elected leaders to end open air drug dealing and use. San Francisco should be a place where those who are not involved in drug sales and drug use, including those in recovery, are not negatively impacted by drug sales and drug use. We believe this should be the top priority of our leaders, and we do not think that that is an outlandish goal. We are not trying to make San Francisco drug free. We know that drugs will always be a part of our society, but we think that in a functioning and vibrant city, people should not be subjected to the violent, dangerous, and deadly drug trade. Drug markets are a market. We think about how do you kill a market? We have to reduce both the supply and the demand. In order to reduce the drug supply, we need law enforcement. In order to reduce demand for drugs, we need recovery programs. Our city leaders currently do not have a coordinated plan to attack both the supply and demand markets, the supply side of the drug markets. We need law enforcement to arrest dealers, we need the DA to prosecute them, and then we need judges to hold them accountable. 
We need the city to work with state and federal agencies to address the problem at its source, the cartels that bring drugs straight to California. The city cannot address that alone. Now, this could mean the National Guard, the CHP, the DEA, the FBI. We would take help from anybody at this point. We also need to make sure that the predominant goal of city-run programs is to get as many users into recovery as possible. Without a serious, organized, and coordinated plan, our city will continue to fail at addressing this crisis. Our city does not currently have such a plan, nor is it a stated priority of our unified city leadership. Tonight, we're gonna to look at the impact, how the crisis has devastated San Francisco, the drug, how fentanyl has changed the nature of the crisis, the role of law enforcement, and the city's approach to treating this public health crisis that is not working. This is how we talk about our city's culture. And then our plan, what we can do to demand that our leaders fix this. So first, the impact. Our city's drug crisis is connected to every other problem that we're facing. Public safety. Drug dealing use and individuals experiencing drug-induced psychosis create an extremely dangerous environment, not only in the Tenderloin, but throughout our city. These issues are also draining our city's resources. For tourism, so like we know that the drug crisis can show like a, a tree cleaning up. It'll be probably Saturday, right? It'll be other weeks. Yes. All right. Let me know. I haven't been to California like more than a year, so can maybe our, I can. Can uh, our host? Oh, okay. Um, well, yes, you, you know, we could actually we could organize Castro being up. Can our host? So, so it's Rick Hall. That we are found okay, found whoever out. is um, whoever is making is that noise, please mute yourself. Otherwise. Um, Mary Eliza or Rick will have to mute you. Thank you. So for tourism, we know the drug crisis has hurt international tourism as several high profile conventions that draw tourists have withdrawn from using San Francisco as a host city due to flagrant drug use and dealing in Soma. Our city relies on that tax revenue from tourism to pay for the services that we need to end the drug crisis. Economic prosperity. In addition to hurting tourism, the drug crisis drives crime as addicts engage in shoplifting and burglary to feed their habit. Having dealers and users blocking off sidewalks is a deterrent for customers, and our city cannot, thr cannot thrive if small businesses cannot thrive. For mental health, a 2019 review of city records revealed nearly 4,000 people are suffering from mental illness, homelessness, and substance abuse disorder at the same time. This review was used to justify the passage of Mental Health SF in 2019. This was a $100 million piece of legislation by Hillary Ronan and Matt Haney, and it was promised to get proper treatment for all San Franciscans needing mental health or substance use health care. That lofty promise remains unfulfilled. And finally, homelessness. A UCSF study found that the number of deaths in homeless people doubled in 2020 and 2021 when compared with the previous three years, with 82% caused by overdoses. So let's look through some statistics on overdose deaths, which are incredibly shocking. Between 2020 and 2022, almost twice as many people died from drug overdoses than from COVID. Every day, somewhere in the city, two people overdose and die. The vast majority of those drug overdose deaths were because of fentanyl. And we're gonna get into why fentanyl is so deadly. Over 3,000 overdoses have been reversed since 2021 and over half of those were in the Tenderloin. That's about seven overdose reversals per day. Of course, we wanna save every life we possibly can. We also think we should have a goal of reducing the number of reversals needed by getting people into recovery. We have allowed drug use and dealing on our streets to become totally normalized. I think a lot of us see this in our daily lives. This is a quote from Kevin Lee, a San Francisco resident in recovery, who said that open drug use has been normalized to the point 
There are blocks where the entire sidewalk is filled with people passed out or getting high. There is not enough emphasis on creating access to treatment. Even our mayor has said the sale of drugs on our streets is killing people and open air drug markets are disrupting neighborhoods for our residents. And Supervisor Matt Dorsey, a vocal advocate for recovery, has essentially accused the city of being the codependent enabler of our city's users, saying our drug crisis owes as much to our civic codependence as it does to an unprecedented level of mass addiction. The social contract in San Francisco is broken. Everyone has a right to live a prosperous, safe, and healthy life. And our elected leaders' jobs are to uphold that contract. They are not holding up their end of the contract right now. Here we have two high-profile cases in which children consumed fentanyl. Victoria Moran Hidalgo was 16 when she was found dead in an alley with fentanyl in her system last year. Also last year, a 10-month-old child was crawling around in a park and accidentally ingested fentanyl. Thankfully, he survived. No parent should have to worry about their children drying of drug overdoses. That's completely unacceptable, and it should be a massive wake-up call for everyone in our city. But since these, death, since these two incidents last year, there have been no policy changes. The fact that our elected officials are not unified in ending these senseless tragedies is unforgivable. Now we're going to talk more about the drug and how fentanyl um, has really changed things. I want to drive home that fentanyl is a different beast than heroin or meth. When people are squeamish about arresting drug dealers or users, they're usually remembering how our federal government responded to these drugs in the 80s and 90s, with a lot of reactionary policies that were more about racism than about drugs. I want to take some time to talk through why fighting fentanyl necessitates a robust response. Fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. The little dot in the corner, that represents how potent fentanyl is. And then the giant bubble next to it is the potency of heroin. This shows you the massive difference between these two drugs. Fentanyl is in almost every other drug on the street right now because it is so much cheaper to produce than those other drugs. And an amount as small as a grain of sand can kill you. It's also the perfect street drug. The DEA says that two main cartels are responsible for our drug supply, the Sinaloa and the New Generation Jalisco cartels. They are flooding our streets with supply, which as you can see in the first chart, Fentanyl seizures by U.S. authorities at the border tripled between 2020 and 2022. In just the first quarter of this fiscal year, that's the red dot, authorities have seized almost as much as the entire amount seized in 2021. It makes sense then that the price for a gram of fentanyl in the tenderloin decreased from $70 to just $35 during the same period. Keep in mind that with fentanyl being as potent as it is, small amounts of it can be cut into other drugs to make them more potent while cheapening the overall supply. The reason fentanyl is the perfect street drug is that it is cheap. In the Bay Area, a kilo of cut fentanyl powder sells wholesale for only about $4,500, reflecting those cheap production costs. Heroin, by comparison, goes for three times that, at about $14,000 to $25,000 per kilo. A fentanyl pill wholesales in San Francisco for $3.50. That's what it costs a supplier. The same pill goes for sale on the street for $20 to $30. That means dealers are making a 700% profit margin in some cases. So how did we get here? There were three major factors that contributed to our current crisis. We do have a nationwide opioid epidemic. We had the COVID-19 pandemic. And for a long time, we've had lax prosecution of drug dealers in San Francisco. 
First of all, we do we do have a nationwide opioid crisis that has been driven by pharmaceutical companies who actively downplayed how addictive their products were. This is a multi-billion dollar business for them. The value of legal opioid businesses has increased from $291 billion in 2010 to $424 billion in 2022. The rate of overdose deaths in America is around 20 times the global average. 75% of drug deaths in 2020 involved an opioid. So some opioid users might be prescribed these drugs by a doctor. They get hooked and then they turn to the street to get more and that's when their lives unravel. So you might hear these big national stories about the Sackler family. This is how that story is playing out on our streets here in San Francisco. Second, we had the pandemic, which made it harder to go places. And that included drug smugglers moving their product. Because it's more potent in smaller doses and can be easily pressed into pills, fentanyl became much easier to move into the country than those bulky drugs like heroin or meth. So we saw an influx of it. And lastly, San Francisco has been very reluctant to prosecute drug dealers. Our former DA, Chesa Boudin, created a culture of normalizing and decriminalizing drug sales. He did not secure a single drug dealing conviction while he was in office. He sent dealers to programs designed for drug users to prevent them from spending time in jail. He was even quoted saying that, Prosecuting drug dealers wouldn't make a difference in fighting the drug crisis. I want to reiterate here that criminalizing drug users is a very different thing than holding drug dealers accountable. We aren't suggesting that those using drugs should be arrested and charged, but we do think that the dealers who are perpetuating this death and violence should face consequences. That brings us to the role of the police, the DA, our lawmakers, and our city departments, what they can do to tackle this crisis. So first of all, despite what people say, we know from the data that increasing policing decreases drug dealing, but we have to do it consistently. Over the past 40 years, we've seen mayors, including Feinstein, Newsom, and Lee, all work with the police to crack down on drug sales, and then we see a drop. But then ultimately it rises again as our leaders deprioritize enforcement on drug dealing. Just as we know drugs will always be present in our city, police presence must always exist to keep the prevalence of drugs at bay. Again, we need to treat the users and the dealers differently. An armed police response might not make sense for a drug user experiencing a crisis. But drug dealing is an inherently violent act and we do need to respond accordingly. Voters made it clear when they elected our new DA, Brooke Jenkins, that they wanted accountability for those who commit drug crimes. Jenkins has shown progress towards holding those committing drug crimes accountable. She's been seeking more pretrial detentions, which means in the most egregious cases, drug dealers will be off the streets until their trials. That was not happening before. She's said she would consider charging drug dealers with murder, and she's revoked 30 plea deal offers that the previous DA gave to fentanyl dealers. Jenkins is dealing with the same drug crisis as her predecessor, but her approach to law enforcement is much more appropriate for the moment we're in. It places a strong emphasis on accountability for the worst offenders. But ultimately, the DA is just one part of the solution. Now we need the Board of Supervisors and the mayor unified behind this message to require the Department of Public Health, Department of Emergency Management, and law enforcement to cooperate and end drug markets. SFPD's tactics in areas like the Tenderloin have faced backlash from anti-police activists. Police reform is needed to reduce racial bias in policing on a national level. But in the case of armed drug dealers, a robust police presence is needed. Our police force is also short on officers, which affects their ability to conduct effective and consistent operations. 
we're actually short over 500 officers according to a 2021 staffing analysis. Right now, they don't have enough staff to cover the large amount of drug dealing that's happening in the city. Well-intentioned police reforms can also contribute to frustration for the force. For example, if any force is applied during an arrest, all officers present at that arrest have to go back to the station and have their body cams uploaded and then reviewed by a sergeant. This takes hours. So it's hours that they are off the street and no one left to be on the street because of short staffing. This forces officers to consider their response to every illegal activity as a cost benefit analysis of whether it's worth taking the risk to make that arrest. The last two years have also shown us that there is a distinct disconnect among the groups who are responsible for handling the drug crisis. While they all say they want to reduce drug deaths and make our city safer, they do not have a unified approach to reach those goals. Mayor Breed is supportive of law enforcement's role in the drug crisis, but should have included a plan to use them in her December 2021 emergency declaration in the Tenderloin. The declaration was toothless without it. A minority, a minority of members of the Board of Supervisors supports law enforcement playing a larger role in the arrest of drug dealers, but the majority do not and advocate only for non-police responses. Their resistance to law enforcement is based on the fact that dealers are immigrants and that by prosecuting them, they may be deported. And we have DPH because the drug crisis is a public health problem DPH is the city department most responsible for responding to it. They report to the mayor, but DPH is not aligned with the mayor's vision and has prioritized harm reduction over recovery. The Tenderloin Linkage Center became a nexus for drug sales when it operated without the necessary increase of law enforcement around it. Our leaders' lack of agreement in policy and ideology on drug sales is what has allowed this to reach a crisis point. It is not acceptable for our leaders to let drug dealers operate as if selling drugs were legal. Doing nothing is not an acceptable option for a functioning city. Note that Mayor Breed and four supervisors, uh, District 6 Dorsey, District 2 Stephanie, District 8 Mandelman, and District 4 and Guardio are deeply supportive of this strategy we're outlining to end the drug crisis, and each has taken actions to push us towards execution of this strategy. However, their efforts need to be part of a cohesive commitment and plan across all relevant government bodies or they will not be successful. We need alignment and a cohesive plan that the mayor, the board of supervisors, the DA, the police, the police commission, they're all working together on and that the Department of Public Health is on board with and helps to execute. Um, after we had our first event in February, uh, City Hall heard our voices and the mayor um, introduced a strategy. She supported SFPD in launching a new strategy to disrupt drug dealing in the Tenderloin. Since then, there was a modest increase in drug sales related arrests in the area but a markedly different uh, visible reduction in dealers on key blocks, according to merchants in the Tenderloin. Uh, since the last round of enforcement started, there have just been two days with zero drug sales related arrests compared to four in the two weeks prior to the start of that. However, SOMA between 4th and 9th remains dangerous and mid-market in general could use the same enforcement treatment. So this is a great initial response to our call to action, but we also expect the city to maintain its commitment to the Tenderloin and to sustain police presence there. And again, a law enforcement response is just one half of our call to action. We also need to see an increase in focused attention on delivering recovery options for users. Um, actually, today was the first vote on the mayor's police supplemental. I'm sure you were all following. This is um, money allocated for police hiring and retention, which was critical to have police staffing given the shortage of officers. Um, this proposal passed the 9-2 vote at the board today, and we'll finally, we'll have a second reading next week at the Board of Supervisors. In addition to the police funding, um, there are a few additional laws that supervisors are looking to pass. 
Uh, Supervisor Dorsey proposed recruitment bonuses to help hire and retain officers. Um, there are the proposed laws that will increase the number of emergency shelter spaces in San Francisco, helping to address homelessness, uh, improving city oversight of nonprofits. Um, and many of these are part of the bigger problems related to the drug crisis. Finally, there's also a new state law that's being proposed to create a new division in the judicial branch that will focus on treating people with severe mental health and substance use problem. We're gonna keep our community up to speed on all this legislation. If you sign up for our emails, you'll get updates about how they're moving through the process and how you can get involved um, and raise your voice on them. So finally, let's talk about the way San Francisco talks about drug use and recovery, which is primarily driven by the policy agenda of DPH and the activists who are aligned with them. The city's approach so far has been to focus on harm reduction instead of abstinence and recovery. This is because the cultural priority is to ensure no one using drugs is stigmatized. If we treat your addiction as a problem or an illness by forcing you into recovery, we are forcing something on you, and that is never the San Francisco way. Harm reduction provides clean and safe tools and aims to minimize intervention, which is very culturally tied to San Francisco's approach to everything. Taking that further, we have this prioritization of offering a safe space and safe tools to prevent you from harming yourself further. What harm reduction doesn't take into account is how we can reduce harm to the greater San Francisco community. It's also very hard to get into recovery in San Francisco, and we'll get into that too. The tension between whether we should be more focused on harm reduction or on abstinence has led to San Francisco being a place that many would say is enabling drug use versus empowering drug users to enter recovery and improve their lives. This divide matters because people in these two camps are vocal advocates and decision makers in influential nonprofits in the public health space and in city departments. We have to wonder why our leaders see this as a divide at all. Why can't our leaders see that these approaches are not mutually exclusive? We believe that a spectrum of services across this range would ultimately be the most impactful. On the left, you'll see some ideas about San Francisco's current ethos surrounding drug use and treatment. In San Francisco, our whole ethos is a hands-off approach unless you need clean supplies to do drugs with, then we give those to you. When those suffering from addiction commit crimes, the city considers your condition when it comes to accountability. It has been considered a violation of people's civil liberties to suggest that the government should be able to compel people into treatment. But this is ultimately enabling addiction and allowing it to continue. These are contradictory arguments, right? If we believe that people cannot be held accountable to the crimes they commit that are driven by their addiction, how can we expect them to proactively go into recovery? If we're saying they're not in their right mind, shouldn't we be stepping in? We all likely know someone struggling with addiction. How far did it have to go before they were able to seek treatment and recovery? On the right, you'll see how this attitude influences policy. This is the actual 2022 plan from DPH to tackle the drug crisis. The goals are ridiculously small. They wanna reduce fatal overdoses by 15% citywide by 2025. Based on last year's total of 638, that's still 542 overdose deaths. That's the goal that they're shooting for. The focus should be on getting more bed space and getting more people into medication assisted treatment and other behavioral health therapies instead of just restoring a heartbeat. We also have Prop T, which is the availability, which is related to the availability of drug treatment beds. And we're going to talk also about the Tenderloin Center to further reveal how our city's culture of approaching this crisis results in the lack of progress. In order to understand the systemic failure by the city to act on the drug crisis, think about this. 
In 2008, voters mandated that the Department of Public Health constantly have a stream of enough drug treatment services to match demand. Prop T requires DPH provide enough substance use disorder treatment capacity to meet the community's demand for publicly funded treatment. Our leaders have failed to deliver on the promise of Prop T as there's been a shortage of beds year after year. Prop T did not encourage tracking client outcomes, only intake and services dispensed. DPH's Prop T annual progress reports have lacked these crucial details. Until last year, they failed to track how many unduplicated clients had been served and what their goals for the next year were. We as voters know this is a failed policy because if DPH could meet the demand for drug treatment services, we wouldn't have people living in misery on the streets. DPH can prioritize this. They have enough money to, they are a $2 billion department, but they have not. This city has over 20,000 injection drug users. Simply put, San Francisco is failing drug users by failing to meet treatment demand. They instead enable a demand for the drugs. Let's look at where the city delivered enough services to meet demand in 2022. There were 1,050 people treated for withdrawal management with just 69 beds. There were 900 clients treated in residential settings with 415 beds. The city is only treating two thirds of the people it can for opioid addiction, and it's only meeting 29% of its capacity for substance use disorder treatment. This leaves a lot to be desired when there are thousands more people who use drugs who aren't in the system. Again, if the city wanted to prioritize this, they would. We have seen them act strongly and quickly with regard to COVID. We are not seeing that with regard to the drug crisis. For those who don't know, the Tenderloin Linkage Center was a city-sponsored safe consumption site which had nonprofit contractors overseeing harm reduction services. The Linkage Center came to represent the cultural dichotomy between harm reduction and abstinence-based recovery methods that exists in the city because it overwhelmingly focused on reversing overdoses instead of actively getting people into treatment. We need facilities that focus on getting people into recovery while also offering harm reduction services. These facilities must also have law enforcement support to ensure they operate safely and that they're not a negative impact on the surrounding community. Our city is not thriving. In fact, it is flame failing, and we know who and what it's to blame. Make no mistake about it, our mayor and our 11 member board of supervisors is responsible for getting San Francisco's drug crisis under control. Coming back to our two prong approach, we need to empower law enforcement to get these drugs off the street, and we need to make sure that both harm reduction and recovery are part of the plan to reduce the number of people who are dependent on drugs in our city. Uh, as a former aide, we, I know how impactful it can be when your inbox is flooded with emails. It's the only way that City Hall will not ignore your requests. And so what we have been asking our community to do is send in a letter. Um, you can scan this QR code. We'll put a link in the chat afterwards. But let City Hall know that you want ending this drug crisis to be the top priority this year, that they must take action, they must come up with a plan, and they must take this seriously. Um, and so with that, I'll end my presentation and I'm happy to, um, to take questions from anybody. Okay, thank you, Kanisha. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the, the way we do Q&A is that uh, first our uh, pre-selected questions pre-delivered uh, to me uh, are asked by me. Then we go to our members uh, who ask their questions. And lastly, we go to uh, non-members who are here tonight uh, to uh, ask their questions. Uh, please keep your questions brief, simple, to the point. Don't go on and on about uh, an introduction before you ask your question. Now, we have two questions tonight. Uh, first question is, 
concerning other cities. Aren't there other cities that have uh, had success with um, uh, drug prevention, uh, drug treatment programs such as methadone maintenance? Yeah, actually something that's come up at our events, usually when we do this event in person, we have somebody from the police, we have someone from the recovery community, and we have someone from the city services side speak about their engagement on the topic. And um, Sam Dodge, who runs this Healthy Street Operations Center and has worked on homelessness in the city for his entire career, he talks about an academic paper that studied four European cities and how they responded to their opioid crises. Um, and all four of them have something in common. They did four things. Um, it was harm reduction, which is considered medicalization. They did treatment, they had shelters, and they had a role for law enforcement. And the biggest thing is they did all four of these things together. They didn't do one at a time. They all have to happen together. And they had a social and political consensus around these four solutions working together. And that's really what we're missing in San Francisco, that social and political consensus that we need a four-prong approach. We need all of these tools to really address this problem. And frankly, our work is about trying to build that social and political consensus to tell our elected leaders that this is a priority for a majority of the city and we want them to address it in this holistic way. Okay, great. I have one more question that's been submitted to me. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there is a um, uh, person named Michael Moritz who's been identified by an article in the New York Times as a founder and supporter, uh, financer of Together SF, Together SF Action. Um, Together SF was the sponsor of Joel and Guardia's inauguration of that at the U United Irish Cultural Center uh, this year. Uh, Joel is the District 4 supervisor, as you know. Uh, could you go into more detail or comment regarding the, the connection between uh, Together SF and Together SF Action with Michael Moritz and Joel and Guardio? Sure. Uh, so Michael, as stated in his New York Times guest essay, is um, sort of a co-founder and, and a key funder of our work at Together SF and Together SF Action. He's um, who's our initial donor and has been a supporter. Um, and then Joel and Guardio is someone we've had a long relationship with as an organization. We host a monthly event called Politics 101 that Joel presents, um, and he has been presenting it for over a year, well before he was even running for supervisor. Um, and so we support him as a community leader and someone who engages with us. And so we also endorsed him when he ran for supervisor in November. Um, he was recommended in our voter guide. And so we have a pretty close and supportive relationship with Joel. Okay, great. Thank you. Now for um, the next part of the Q&A, uh, I would ask people who are members of CSFN uh, to go down to their um, uh, dashboard and to see the, the place called reactions and to uh, click that on and raise their hands mechanically as I have raised mine, okay? And if you are calling in or uh, uh, can't activate this, then as I just did, lower your hand. But anyway, uh, if, you, if, if you have a problem and need to raise your hand physically, uh, Glenn will uh, help me. Uh, identify people uh, both with mechanically raised hands and with raised hands. And I see we have a, a question already from Claire Zavansky. I don't have a question. I My comments are in the chat. Oh, Mari okay. has a question. Um, oh, yes. oh, sorry. Okay, Mari. Yes, I just had one question uh, regarding um, treatments. Is there a drug like methadone that works for fentanyl, or is that only uh, is that one that doesn't work that way? There is something called uh, buf buprenorphine um, that the city does have a supply of that helps people come off of fentanyl. It's still very, very hard and challenging. There's a lot of physical reactions to it. Um, I believe on April. I forget the date that we're doing it. Um, Kyle or Rob, if you can remind me. We're doing a, an event um, that is very much like this, but it is specific to the treatment options the city offers. And we'll be a much deeper dive into those various um, treatment options. It's April 5th. Okay, I'm looking for uh, hands, but I'm not seeing them. 
Uh, I, I know we have uh, two, we have one or two uh, 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 call in patrons. Uh, do either of you call in people have a question that you'd like to ask? Um, Eileen? Rachel Grant has her hand raised. Okay, I'm, I see that, but I'm asking first uh, for Eileen to ask a question. If she has it, then I'll go to Rachel. Actually, Rachel is not a member, but we'll get to her, don't worry. No call-in questions by member members? Okay, are there any other questions by members of CSFN before we go on to other questions? Okay, Charles, I, uh, I pre-submitted my question. This is like- this Right, is yeah, I, yeah, she's already answered that. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, seeing no further questions from CSFN members, Rachel. Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel, yeah, you are a CSFN member now. Yeah good okay. <laughs> no worries no worries well just i'll, I'll get thank it right you, first of all yeah for um what a great little presentation and very um helpful i found like just understanding why this particular drug has become so dominant um really insightful when you're talking about solutions uh particularly when it comes to treatment we know that um, housing is important, but not without wraparound services. And I'm just wondering about, you know, we saw in the SF Boundless documentary how, you know, a large campus was built and developed in Texas. They have the land, they have the space. Um, do you see any efforts that are similar to that being started here in San Francisco? Do you see that as a viable solution here in San Francisco, meaning a campus that has drug treatment, housing, career development, education, family support services. Uh, yeah, I know the campus you're talking about and I agree with you that is the right approach and that's what we need to be doing. It doesn't seem to be yet being discussed in San Francisco as a reality. I think a lot of that is because San Francisco's policymakers are not yet focused on those wraparound like truly holistic services to get people out of addiction stabilized and then into recovery and then into living a full life. What we're uncovering, what we'll talk about more at the April 5th event, is that they're kind of just focusing on restoring a heartbeat with overdose reversals, but not much more than that. And so I think until our city makes the conscious choice to say we want to give people a full life and we're going to invest in the services to give them that, not just sticking them in a shelter or just in an SRO or even a housing unit, um, I don't think we're going to get there. And it's a real shame because it seems like that is a solution that does work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Kanishka. Um, okay. Um, Claire, you have a question now. Yeah. I'm wondering if for most of the people that are um, either arrested as dealers, but especially the users that are being picked up and uh, putting into treatment. Are they all local residents or are these people who come from other jurisdictions, other towns, and are ending up in San Francisco, maybe because of the availability of the drugs? Do we Are we keeping any kind of records of where people are coming from? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, our city, unfortunately, doesn't track those things, or if they do, it's not publicly available. It's been very difficult for us to try to get a hold of. I think the common knowledge that you see sort of on these like man on the street videos and interviews you see on social media is that because we are such a tolerant environment to open drug use and we have such a readily accessible supply of drugs, obviously we are going to be a draw to people around the region and the state to come here and, and use drugs and behave this way, but we don't have hard stats and data on it. Um, we're also still not making arrests of people who are con who are um, engaging in public drug use, which is illegal. But as a city policy, we don't arrest for that. And so what the new DA has put in place is a rule where they get cited for open drug use. And upon three citations, she will bundle them and bring forward a case where she offers you either to go through a trial where she'll prosecute you for that open drug use, or you can take treatment. So that's sort of the closest we come to compel treatment in San Francisco. Okay, thank you. Can, can we somehow um, ask the city to provide some of the information with regard to um, where these people come from? I mean, is it an unreasonable request 
is it violating anything or uh, I don't, might it I don't be think it's an unreasonable request for law enforcement. I think it's probably part of citation and arrest records. Um, but with DPH, they really don't collect any of that. And we see that as a big problem. And how can we make database decisions about what's working if we're not tracking the users that are coming to the city for these services? Um, but DPH has not been interested in tracking those things. I think they are citing HIPAA violations. Yeah. It's, um, but it is HIPAA. something that we are digging more into. Yeah. It, yeah. It would okay, thank be, you, Claire. They would hide it under HIPAA. You're right. right. Thank you. Right. Claire, one question per person. Thank you, Claire. Okay, George. George, I think you're muted. Yeah, George, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, Kanishka. Hi, George. Um, do you know how much San Francisco spends on homelessness a year? The number that's thrown around is a billion dollars a year. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. And um, forgive me, Charles. I just, do you know how many nonprofits there are working on homelessness right now? I don't know that number. And they overlap. Yes, are, there's a lot of duplication. Non, are you a nonprofit as well? We are a nonprofit, but we don't receive any city funding or have any city contracts. How do you see your role fitting in with the other nonprofits in the city? Well, we're not a service provider, so it's very different from any of the nonprofits we're talking about that, that, that get city contracts to provide services either on homelessness or drug recovery, whatever it may be. We're not a service provider. We're a civic engagement and advocacy organization. So there is a, a big distinction there. We're never going to apply for city funding because we take political positions and we want to get people engaged in reaching out to their elected officials. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any anybody else, either CSFN member or not a CSFN member, who'd like to ask a question? Uh, George, you need to lower your hand. Thank you. Okay. Seeing none, I just want to thank you, Kanishka, and thank, thank the rest of the people in your organization who are here tonight that I've um, been privileged to uh, deal with. And again, Glenn and I appreciate your coming back tonight to. Uh, uh, all us again with your presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me back. And please feel free to reach out to any of us um, if you have questions and want to get more involved. Okay, great. Thank you.